As Emerson said, you become what you think about most of the time. Earl Nightingale, in his Strangest Secret of Success, simply said that you become what you think about all day long. In computer language, they have an expression, Geigo, which means garbage in, garbage out. But it also means good in, good out. Now, if the human being was like an animal and that we were programmed permanently and could never change our instincts and our responses, then we would have no hope. But the good news is that everything that we have learned, we can unlearn. That everything that has been programmed into us can be deprogrammed and can be overridden with new programming. Programming your mind for success. You know that a computer, if you program a computer, it simply operates on the basis of the computer, on the basis of the programming. If you want to get different results in your outer world, you have to put in a different program for your mental programmer. So this is how we do it. We say your self-concept is your bundle of beliefs inside that determines everything that happens to you. Remember, all change begins with a change in your self-concept, the way you see yourself and think about yourself and believe about yourself. Um, there was a man uh, many years ago, very famous, true story, his name was Viktor Sarabriakov. And Viktor Sarabriakov was the parent of immigrant laborers who came over from Russia. And he grew up and he went to school. And he seemed to float through school. He did, he did whatever schoolwork was necessary. But he daydreamed a lot. And sometimes he read other things and looked out the window. And they concluded that he was um, probably mentally retarded, did not really have he had learning deficiencies, wasn't really set up, set up to be very successful. And so he went all the way up to the 10th, 12th grade, and he was still looking out the window, and he sat down with his counselor in the 12th grade, and they suggested that he join the Army. Because in the Army, he could get a nice job where they would provide for him for 25 or 30 years, and then he could have a nice pension, and he could retire, and he would be safe and secure. And he didn't think much about that, so he left school, and he drifted. And he worked as a farm laborer. Two years later, he'd been drifting around. He's now about 20 years old. Uh, he saw a sign, you know, the Army needs men. And he remembered the recommendation from his uh, guidance counselor in high school. So he went in and he applied. So he went in to enlist, and they said fine. And his background was average grades in high school and labor for two years, not great Army material. Uh, so they gave him a battery of psychological and intelligence tests. When they came back with the tests, his IQ scored at 172. And they said, <laughs> no, there's something wrong here with this test, this score. So they, they tested him again. They had him take the test again, came out at 176. His IQ was higher than Einstein's of 170. They couldn't believe it. They took him in and they sat him down. And they said, Mr. Sarabriakov, you're one of the smartest. You're the smartest person who's ever tried to enlist in the Army. And he said, yeah, but I got terrible grades throughout school. And they had a, school, they had a psychologist there. And he said, well, it's because you basically have a photographic memory. You memorized everything there was to learn in school. The instant it was first mentioned, it was completely boring for you. That's why you're looking out the window all the time. He said, that's true. He said, I never failed an exam because he learned everything like a sponge absorbs water. They said, Mr. Sarabriakov, if you'll join the Army and you'll go into our nuclear physicist training, we will put you through university if you will stay in the Army for four years after your degree. And he said, sounds good to me. When his time was up at 30, he started his own company, which is in Los Angeles, and Sarah, you know, Sarah Bryakov Industries. Within something like two years, he had six major high-tech patents, each of which was sold and licensed for millions of dollars. By the time he was 35, he still lives in Los Angeles today. He's worth millions and millions of dollars. One of the brightest people that they'd ever seen in terms of his creative ability. but. He didn't know. He'd been programmed from his poor parents and his childhood and the teachers that paid no attention to him to believe he was not very smart. And when they finally showed him how smart he was, he just changed his programming. When he changed his programming, this, became, this guy became a mental machine. He was a genius of the highest order. So it's very possible for us to change all of our external results by changing our programming about ourselves. So programming your mind for success, the psychology of becoming says that you are in a constant state of becoming. Each one is in a continuous state of, of growth and change. And you're continuing moving forward. And you're growing and changing depending upon the information that you're taking in. 
Now, the great tragedy is that if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So if you're continually taking in the same old information, whether it's frivolousness or television set or, or, or TV or Twitter or something else, if you just keep in taking the same thing and, and keep hanging out with the same people and reading the same papers, then nothing will change. The natural tendency is you just go on forever. But if you start to take in new information and new ideas and read new things and talk to new people, you start to evolve and grow in a different way, in a different direction, and at a different speed. So, so we say if you want to evolve and grow more rapidly, you must make your goals clear and describe them in detail. The interesting thing is, the, as soon as you are absolutely clear that you want to achieve a particular goal, you start to get all kinds of ideas to achieve that goal. You start to see all kinds of possibilities. You activate your reticular cortex and you start to see ideas that can help you everywhere. You start to run into people and meet people. It's really quite astonishing. I remember reading a story of a, of a serial entrepreneur and he'd made many millions of dollars in uh, different businesses. And one day he was reading the Wall Street Journal and it said imports of Italian racing bicycles increased 37% in the last 12 months. And that's what it was, just a little thing from one of the Department of Trade publications. So he said, 37% growth rate, that's pretty good. He said, I wonder why that is. So he started to do some research. And what he found was, this is many years ago, his Italian racing bicycles, which is very popular today, were almost unknown in the US. He got in touch with the major Italian bicycle manufacturers. He opened a store. He imported the bicycles. He advertised, and they started to sell. By the time he was finished, he had 32 stores selling Italian bicycles by the shipload. And he made something like 15, 20 million dollars before he sold the business. It all came from just noticing that little notice. But the thing is, he was looking for the notice. He was looking for business ideas. So when you start to think that you want to make a lot of money, you're going to see opportunities. So, so keep your mind open, because once you're clear about it, you're going to start to attract opportunities for everything you could possibly accomplish. Now, you must dwell on them most of the time. Remember, you cannot have a goal and think about it once a month. It's just like being married and thinking about your family once a month. It does not really mean you're, you're, you're really committed. So there are two obstacles to becoming everything you are capable of becoming. Obstacle number one is homeostasis. Uh, it means that you become rigid and fixed in the way that you think. Homeostasis is a another rephrasing of the comfort zone. It's a major reason that people don't grow is because they get locked into what they've already done in the past and they're very uneasy about doing something new and you're not willing to try new things. And so be alert to these the natural tendency to slip into a comfort zone and fight to stay there, and the natural tendency to resist new ideas. In order to get yourself out of the comfort zone, they, they found that it's, it's if I, I like to use an example like this, when Warren Bennis did his study called Leaders, which was one of the, the best-selling book on leadership of the 90s, they'd studied 93 leaders, and they studied them for five years to find out what qualities they had that made them different. And there were different, completely different industries, and they found there were five. And one of them was they refused to get stuck in a comfort zone. And so what they did is they would get into a comfort zone. We say the only difference between a comfort zone and a rut is the, is the depth. No, between a rut and a grave is the depth. And when they would get into this comfort zone very quickly, and the only way they could get out is by using a grappling hook, if you like, and throwing a grappling hook up to pull themselves out of the comfort zone, and it was always a big goal. And so what you do is you, by creating a big goal, you're forced out of your comfort zone because you cannot stay at your current level of performance uh, and, and set a big goal for yourself. The goal forces you to think bigger, which is why we talked about putting a zero at the end of your income goal. It forces you. There's no way that you can, you can achieve that uh, doing what you're now doing. You're going to have to do something different, and you're going to have to do it in a different place in a different way. So we say there are two great powers that control everything that happens to you. The first is the power of love. The power of love is the greatest power in our lives. It's been said that everything we do is either to get love or to compensate for lack of love. From the time we are children, moving from discomfort toward comfort, from we from pain toward pleasure, we're always striving to get the unconditional love and affection and respect of the people who are most important to us. And remember I said earlier that we strive for all of our adult life to compensate for what we felt we were deprived of as children. The second uh, great power uh, that controls everything that happens to you is the power of suggestion. And you and I are inordinately suggestive in that we are, that we are constantly affected by the suggestive elements in our world. 
Everything counts. Every single word we hear, every conversation we have, every song we listen to or news story, everything we read has an effect on us and it's helping us or hurting us. Everything counts. Everything counts. If I were to say to you, geez, there's some great research. It says that if you eat really, really healthy foods, you're going to feel much better and have more energy and sleep better and your skin will be better and your digestion will be better and everything else. If you eat really, really good foods, did you know that? You'd say, come on, give us a break. We've known that for 50 years. We know what we should eat, we just don't eat it uh, because we like delicious things. And really good foods are not always delicious. So, of course we know that, but if I were to say that everything that you take into your mind affects your personality and your temperament and your self-confidence and your goals and your clarity and your intelligence, it has a tr profound transforming effect. You'd say, wow, that's an interesting thought. Everything you take into your physical body affects you physically. Everything you take into your mind affects you mentally and emotionally, and it affects the results that you get in life. Number seven is the law of emotions. We say every decision that you make is based on emotion of some kind. The stronger emotion will dominate a weaker emotion and will determine what you do. In other words, if you have an emotion of desire to become successful in your work, but you have an emotion of fear and insecurity, you don't want to lose your security, which every emotion is the uh, most intense, is the one that will dominate the other. There's a story of uh, the old Indian chief, and he said, I have two wolves, he said, on either shoulder. The black wolf on one shoulder is always luring me to, to do things that are not good for me. And he said, the white wolf on the other shoulder is always encouraging me to do things that are good for me. And the person he was talking to said, which is the wolf that dominates? And he said, the one I feed. The one that I pay the most attention to is the one that dominates my thinking. So you can actually, by continually thinking about what you desire, you actually cause that to become more intense and you cause the fear that's holding you back to become less and less. And so pretty soon the desire for success, happiness, achievement is much greater than the fears that hold most people back. And you do it little by little, just by dwelling on it over and over. And so that eventually becomes your stronger emotion. So we say the law of expression says, whatever is impressed is expressed. This comes from Aristotle, by the way, the law of expression. In other words, whatever you take in to yourself, you read, listen to, talk, and so on, talk about, and so on, you, ex you express in your life and your conversation. You can always tell what's going on inside a person by listening to their conversation, because they're always expressing what they're thinking about. So what are, whatever is impressed is expressed. So be very careful that you impress into your mind only really positive things, because those are what will be expressed and you only want to be expressing really positive, healthy thoughts. So number nine, the law of reversibility. This is one of the great laws, and what it says is this, is if you achieve a certain level of success or good health or happy relationships, that accomplishment will create a subjective state, a feeling or emotional state that goes with it. In other words, if you win something, you feel like a winner, and you act like a winner, you get the emotion of winning from the act itself. But what happens is the objective reality, the fact of success, creates the subjective state or the emotion. And this is what we say, so that if you are a winner, you feel like a winner. But if you are not, haven't been a winner, if you create the feeling, just think how you would feel if you succeeded in this area. And you start to think and create a visual picture of yourself succeeding. So the principle of reversibility says if you really feel great about yourself, you'll behave in a great way. But if you don't feel in a great way, you can create the feeling within yourself, or you can act your way into feeling. You can act like you're already successful and you create the feeling. Or you can feel that you're already successful and it will create the action. So it's really important. This law of reversibility goes back and forth. Um, what William James of Harvard says, that if, if you uh, do not have an emotion, but pretend as if you already do have the emotion, you'll experience the emotion that would go along with the success. So we ima say, imagine that you have your goal already. Imagine that you're already at your goal. Get the feeling, create the feeling as though you were already a big success, as though you're already successful, as though you already were achieving what you achieved, and then replay and recreate that feeling over and over again. And the law of practice says that whatever you do over and over again, often enough becomes a new habit. So you can do develop new habit patterns of thought and action just simply by repetition. 
Every habit you have today was by repetition, so you can cancel the old habits and start new ones. A new habit takes about 21 days to develop. So follow a 21-day positive mental attitude diet and resolve that for 21 days, you're only going to think and talk about what you want, and you're not going to think and talk about things that you don't want. Your goal is to become a purely positive person so that you're just positive all the time. And if you have a setback or an obstacle that causes you to become upset or angry, you bounce back quickly. My friend Charlie Jones used to say, it's not how far you fall, but how high you bounce that counts. And so what you do is you just pre-program yourself. And this is one of the great pre-programmings that I learned, is that no matter what happens, I will respond to it in a positive way. You need four qualities to make great changes in your personality and your character. Quality number one is desire. The only real limit on what you can accomplish is the question, how badly do you want it? Many people think, well, I want to be this and I want to be that. And I want to be rich and I want to be thin. And I want to be successful and I want to be happy and I want to have a great relationship or marriage. But people in mental institutions have the same wishes. These are not goals. They're just fleeting wishes. I call them cigarette smoke goals. They just disappear in the air. Because men, they want to go party and they want to go drinking. They want to go have fun with their friends and they want to tweet and they want to waste time at work and so on. So they want all of these conflicting things. The achievement of one, the time wasters, makes it impossible to achieve the others that are worthwhile. They want to eat whatever they can eat. They want to live without exercising and so on. So the question is, how badly do you want it? And if you really want it badly enough, then what happens is you stop doing the things that are contradictory to it. Decision. You must be willing to do whatever is necessary to achieve your goal. Now, I have to give you a word. And this is one of the great words. And it comes from about a 30-year study. And I said, what is the difference between successful people and failures? And the, the, decision, the, the conclusion was willingness. Now, willingness means that successful people are willing to do whatever is necessary to achieve the goal. They said unsuccessful people are willing to do many things, but just not everything. They're willing to work hard, but not stay late. And they're willing to work during the week, but not on the weekends. And they're willing to upgrade their skills, but they don't want to take time away from reading the sports pages and watching the football game. And they're willing to exercise, but they don't really like to sweat too much, you know? So they like really gentle exercises, like getting up from the couch and getting back down again. So uh, decision. Make a decision and then be willing to do whatever is necessary within law. I'm not saying be dishonest, but be willing to pay the price. Be willing to pay the price. Uh, discipline is the master key to riches. And this is really the most important key of all, is the ability to discipline yourself to do it whether you feel like it or not. To just keep on keeping on until it becomes a habit. But remember this, what, wherever you are today, you've gotten here by the things you have done or failed to do in the past. Wherever you want to go in the future, there's no limit because you can control it. And when you start to practice self-discipline, which Napoleon Hill called the master key to riches. When you start to practice self-discipline, it becomes easier and easier. And here is, the great, here is the great discovery, is that every act of self-discipline raises your self-esteem and your self-confidence. Every act of self-discipline deepens your persistence and your determination. Every act of self-discipline makes you stronger and more confident in yourself. When you practice self-discipline, you actually build yourself as a person. And that's why you find that the greatest men and women in history have worked on themselves, like working out with weights, to become very disciplined and focused in doing the things that they need to do to be successful. So every step you take toward becoming more disciplined actually raises your self-esteem and self-confidence and makes it easier for you to take the next step. So self-discipline is really the master key to riches. It's the foundation skill that makes everything possible. If you develop discipline, which is a learnable skill, you can accomplish anything in life. You can achieve any physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual goal. And especially you can achieve any financial goal if you just simply de develop the disciplines that are necessary to achieve it.